Hi everyone, my name is Carlos Corrado, pastor and founder of Christ Point Church Melbourne. Thank you and bless you for allowing us to come to the sanctuary of your homes once again to share God's Word with you. We at Christ Point Church Melbourne are here to share the good news of salvation to everyone, beginning here at home in the beautiful city of Melbourne, Australia, all the way to the ends of the world. The church is not a building but a group of people who believe in Jesus as their Lord and Savior and have a true relationship with the Father in heaven and are a dwelling place for the Holy Spirit. We at Christ Point Church Melbourne want to be able to help people connect to their destiny, and their destiny is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Then we want to equip them to go out into the world and connect others to their destiny also by sharing the gospel of Jesus. The Word of God tells us this in the book of Romans, chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This morning, we're continuing with our November series, Confronting Our Culture. And this morning, we will be talking about the solution to self-centeredness. This morning, I also want to take some time to remind you of some of the activities that are happening here at Christ Point Church Melbourne. Now, next week, we will continue with this series, and we will be looking at Taming Your Netflix. On Sunday, the 25th of November, we will be having Pastor Jonathan running the Youth Sunday service. In December, we will begin with our Christmas series, Christmas Stories, which will run for the whole month of December and the Christmas season. Oh yes, be sure to join us for our Carol's Night on Saturday the 19th of December at 7 p.m. via YouTube Live and or live stream via the official Christ Point Church Melbourne app, free on the App Store and Google Play. Now we will be having a Christmas Eve service in Spanish, which will be aimed and directed to our Spanish-speaking audience and community worldwide. So be sure to keep up to date with our events and activities via our social media and also our app. Now God is good all the time. He is good and blessing His children. The team and I are looking forward to what God has for us next year. And God willing, it will be an even bigger and better year for us all. Again, thank you for joining us today. God bless you. Let us pray this morning. Dear Heavenly Father and Lord Jesus, we thank you this morning for having given us the blessing of being able to connect to you via Christ Point Church, Melbourne. From the comfort of our homes and dwelling places, we pray that you give us all ears to listen, eyes to see, a mouth to share, and hearts to keep your holy word. We pray for those who are sick, those who are struggling with cancer and other serious illnesses. You know our friends by name and know their specific needs and wants. We pray, Lord, that you answer their prayers according to your perfect will. We pray for those who are mourning around the world. Please, Lord, bring them peace and comfort and healing. We pray for those people in Victoria as restrictions are eased. May people learn to be sensible and responsible as they head back out into society and everyday life. We pray for Daniel Andrews. We know he has had the difficult task to lead our state during these extreme hard times. Give him the wisdom to continue to lead us. Give him as well a well-deserved rest. Bless him and his family. Lord, I ask you that you use me as a vessel and give me the authority to convey your message to those who see and hear us. May they all be touched by the Holy Spirit and your word. We pray this and a whole lot more in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Stay with us as we sing praises and worship to our Lord and King. Trusting you have better plans I haven't even dreamt of yet I know that you will follow me When everything's against me I put all my hope in you Jesus, I will trust you Oh, you know. 
Blessed be the name of the Lord. 
Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name.
day a brand new chance to say Jesus, you are the only way My Savior, my Savior lives Yeah, I know that my Redeemer lives And now I stand on what He did My Savior, my Savior lives Every day a brand new chance to say Hi and welcome back. Let us open our Bibles to the book of Romans, chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true, proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing and perfect will. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning with open ears to hear, open eyes to see, an open mind to discern what you have for us this morning. I pray, Lord, that you put words into my mouth that are a blessing and benefit to those watching and listening. May I only be a channel, a conduit, a vessel, an instrument which is used by you. I ask that it is the Holy Spirit that softens people's hearts and may it be you, Lord, that teaches us today through your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're on a series titled Confronting Our Culture. Now we've spoken in prayer as we think about the culture, the place that we live in, the world that we live in, and the world around us. And I guess we think immediately of Melbourne. We think of Victoria, we think of Australia. But there are cultures within our workplace that have a separate culture all of their own. There's cultures in our homes that have a separate culture all of their own. There's a culture in our street that might be different from the street across from us. There are cultures and variations of these cultures all around us. Now we're aware that as we live this, our lives, that the culture that we live in is rapidly moving away from biblical principles and values. There was a time not long ago, probably in my grandparents' day, where most of these cultures reflected biblical values and standards. And that's so much different nowadays. It is so much different as we raise our children to what it was when our grandparents and possibly even our parents raised us. Now my suggestion is that the culture that we live in, this moving away from biblical values and standards, is not making life any better is not making the world around us any better as we abandon God's principles. We abandon good things and we're replacing them with bad things that are harmful for us. Now the danger for us, because we have a competing culture around us, it becomes normal to live the way everybody else is living. To have those same values and standards and principles that everyone else has all around us because we're immersed in it. Now, you can't be alive and not be immersed in that culture. The danger that we have is because we just accept what surrounds us. We don't realize that the culture that surrounds us is actually competing with our faith, our values, and our standards. One of the issues that is latent in our culture is that of self-centeredness. Now, if I said to you, you are a self-centered person, you would most likely take that as an insult or an offense, wouldn't you? And you'd be right to do so. But if I looked at you in the eye and I said to you, you are a self-centered person, you'd definitely be offended by that. You might even have some words back at me. But the reality is that we live in a culture that breathes self-centeredness. 
And when we really stop and pause and just chip away at all the layers of all the things about our lives and all the things that go on around us and we look really closely at how we live, how our culture operates, we realize that it is a very selfish culture. We're drip-fed a lie that all that matters is me. That's the lie that we are told day by day and we are fed day by day. All that matters is me and no one else. The goal of my life is to pursue everything that's going to make me happy and that's the way our culture dictates us to. If you go into any bookshop, you'll find row upon row upon row of self-help books all about how I can make my life better and how I can therefore be happier. There are books on self-awareness, self-confidence, self-analysis, self-discovery, self-enrichment, self-esteem, self-fulfillment, self-identity, self-image, self-improvement, self-indulgence, self-realization, self-respect, and the list goes on and on and on. Now, people are making millions of dollars because they're, they've tapped into this realization that our culture is a self-absorbed culture. Our complete focus is on what is in it for me and what's going to make me happy. We're in a culture that's preoccupied with self. And when we make that personal, we're in a culture that's preoccupied with me. 2,000 years ago, the Apostle Paul wrote this to his friend Timothy. He said this in his second letter to Timothy, chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. And the Word of God tells us, But know this, in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. In other words, he said that in the last days it's going to be very difficult to be a Christian for people will love only themselves and their money. 2,000 years ago, Paul wrote this, but he could have easily written it yesterday and it would still be as true and relevant and perhaps more so nowadays. In the last days, people will live only for themselves and their money. Again, when we throw away and chip away all the layers of our culture and just come back to a common basic level of living, this is who we are at the moment. The lie is, look out for number one and you'll be happy for the rest of your life. The opposite is true. The more we simply live for number one, the more we just live our lives for ourselves. The more we focus on life and everything that's going on around it, it's all about us and no one else. The worse our society gets, the unhappier people get. I want to suggest three serious negative results of self-centeredness that's impacting our society today. The first one is disintegrating families. While people are simply living for themselves, it's all about me and my happiness. When husbands think that, when wives think that, and when kids think that, their families are falling apart all over the place. Because family is not about an individual. Family is about the group. Now, a well-known scientist by the name of Daniel Yankelevich did a study in the U.S. on America's search for self-fulfillment. And he interviewed thousands of people. It was a big research thing that he did. And once he had finished, he said this quote, Among the married people I interviewed, those most devoted to self-fulfillment were those having the most trouble in their marriage. Unquote. Let me read it again. Among the married people I interviewed, those most devoted to self-fulfillment were those having the most trouble in their marriage. Those devoted to themselves. Those devoted to my rights, my privileges, my happiness. It's all about me. Ignoring their spouses, ignoring their husbands and their wives, ignoring their kids. This is what I want. Remember Samson last week? What Samson wants, Samson gets. Now, I know my nine-year-old son Jason was paying attention to me last Sunday as he brought it up at the dinner table last week. When he was asking for more ice cream, he said, what Samson wants, Samson gets. Now, the way my wife looked at me, I knew that I was in trouble. 
So let's go back to the message. So people who are self-centered and only thinking of themselves, they were having the most trouble in their marriages. Does this surprise you? Of course it doesn't. It doesn't surprise me either. And that's not surprising because marriage is about abandoning the idea of self. Marriage is about abandoning the idea of individuals or individualism. And it's about embracing the couple and then the family unit. It's not about me anymore. It's about us from now on. Daniel Yankelevich quotes another mother that he interviewed. A mother who decided to go back to work for self-fulfillment. That's why she decided to go back to work for self-fulfillment. And she said the following, I thought it was what I wanted. I now feel tricked. My husband and I now lead separate lives. Now there's something wrong with his arrangement, but I can't put my finger on it. It's a pretty sad statement, isn't it? A very sad statement. For the sake of an ambition that at least one person wanted for themselves, you know, I will be a better person. I will be more fulfilled. I will be whatever it is that I want to be. I will go back to work. I will do this. I will do that. I will do something else, but forgetting completely about the rest of the family unit. Disintegrating families is a result of self-centeredness. And our society is all right with that. It's part of the norm. It's part of the cultural norm. Superficial relationships is another result of self-centeredness. As we go chasing our own ambitions, as we go chasing fulfillment, as we go chasing happiness and satisfaction, these are the comments that we hear. I don't have time for closeness. Have you heard that before? I don't have time for friendships. I don't have time for relationships. I'm too busy pursuing my own goals. I can't afford to let a relationship interfere with my career or my plans or my goals. That is being said more and more in our culture today. There's a generation of young professional people who the elderly nowadays are absolutely disgusted with because they seem to have no morals whatsoever. Sexual activities are on increase, multiple partners are on an increase, go from one partner to another partner, then to another, over and over and over again. Some people are saying that this is just a decline in moral values, and I guess that's partly true. But what a lot of it is, is simply loneliness. We have a lonely group of young people because they're too busy trying to fulfill themselves trying to chase all these goals and become millionaires by the time they're 25. Just pouring out their lives into these ambitions, they haven't got time to sit down for a decent relationship. They haven't got time to be with someone long enough to get to know them well enough and intimately enough to share their rest of their lives together. The sexual activities of young professionals is more about loneliness than it is about loose morals. It's about diving between the sheets and we have a moment of connection that's replacing strong relationships. And as soon as we slip out of those sheets, we find that we're alone again. So the cycle just continues and continues. The third result of self-centeredness today is frustration and despair. You see, if you set yourself up as the center of the universe, it will eventually cost you your family and your friends. If you don't achieve your goals, and mind you that most people don't achieve their goals, what have you got? What have you got? If you set yourself up as the center of the universe, and it costs you your family and your friends, and you don't achieve that marvelous thing that you set yourself on getting, being a detriment to your family and your friends, what have you got? You've got nothing, absolutely nothing. And even if you do reach those goals, who do you have to share it with? Now, I recently achieved a couple of things that I never thought I could, beginning with taking the leap of faith in opening and establishing Christ Point Church Melbourne. When I told my friends and family about it, they rejoiced with me. Now, some began saying, are you nuts, a church? But then they rejoiced with me. We are now in our ninth month of being live every Sunday morning at 10 a.m., a few years ago, I began Bible college. You know, I shared this leap of faith with my friends and family, and they rejoiced with me. 
Earlier in the year, I completed my theology studies. You know, I shared this event with my family and friends who rejoiced with me. A couple of months ago, I completed my pastor's education and my family rejoiced with me when I shared this information. I have been blessed to have been offered a Bible college scholarship which commences in January with Baptist International Mission and I shared this with my family who also rejoiced with me. Now we as a church have an enormous announcement to make in the coming weeks in regards to the growth and international recognition of Christ Point Church Melbourne. Now I won't let the cat out of the bag just yet, but when I do, it will be something that I know that my family and friends will also rejoice in, and I pray that you do too. So stay tuned. Now when something good happens in your life, you want to share it. When something good and exciting and a blessing happens in your life, you know, you can't wait to share it. You want to get home and share it with the people that you love, for example, your family and your friends. That's what life is all about. It's about other people. I can't wait to tell people about what's going on in my life. And if you don't have nobody to share it with, if you haven't got any strong relationships, then you're in trouble. You're in big trouble. A few weeks ago, we preached about going big. Well, being lonely is surely something you don't want to be going big for. If it's all about you, yourself, even your achievements fall flat because you have no one to celebrate them with, no one to share them with. Now, how do we counteract the influence of our selfish culture? What do we do? What is it that we should be doing as Christian people to try and counteract this culture that's driving us in a direction that is not God's way? Well, the first thing we have to do is build strong relationships. The antidote to self-centeredness the antidote to live a life of selfishness and the antidote to living a life just for me is to develop strong relationships. The word strong is very important here because there are many relationships right across our society at the minute, but most of them are superficial. Most of them are skin deep and that's as far as they go. It's about building strong relationships. The book of Genesis chapter 2 verse 18 tells us, The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. Now technically, the word man is man. It is not good for the male to be alone. But I want us to read that in the terms that it is not good for people to be alone. Because that principle is exactly the same. We use this verse in terms of marriage. We bring this verse out when we're marrying someone or someone's getting married. It's not good for man to be alone. So God made a woman. He made a couple. He invented marriage. And that's absolutely the context behind this verse. But it is also more than that. It is not good for people to be alone. People need friends. People need companionship. People need strong relationships. People need to be a part of society and to be a part of life. We need people to be able to laugh with. We need people to cry with. We need people to play with. We need people to work with. It is in strong friendships that we find comfort, security, and acceptance. You see, that is how God wired us. It is not good for a person to be by themselves. God recognized this and He did something about it. It is good for people to have good relationships. God wired us up as social beings, and that's how He created us. We need other people around us. Other people bring an extra dimension to our lives. If we're just doing life by ourselves, all we've got is us. When we do life with other people, we have a whole heap of other resources. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 11 tells us, Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. We need to be together, working together for the Lord as we wait for His return. We can't do that if we're living in self-centeredness and if we're living alone. However, caring about somebody else is the antidote to self-centeredness. It's not just about being married. That's one way where we develop strong relationships. I'd like to suggest that many marriages around the place are just superficial anyways. 
But within our marriages, we need to develop strong relationships. But it's not just about marriage, it's about building strong relationships with other people, as hard as it may be sometimes. And yes, there will be friends who will betray you. People who you thought were your friends who have turned out to be acquaintances or not even close to that. People who pretended to be your friends but ended up being the person who caused you the biggest heartache. However, we are to build strong relationships with people so we can share an aspect of life and they can share theirs with us. When you care about somebody deeply, you become a giver. You focus on somebody else rather than yourself. You see, when you focus only on yourself, you are a square peg in a round hole. You're operating differently to what God created you to be. You're trying to make your life what was never intended to be. The book of Acts chapter 20 verse 35 reminds us, In everything I showed you that by working hard in this way you must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said himself, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Jesus said it is better to give than to receive. But if you're a self-centered person caught up in our culture living only for yourself, just to get everything that you can out of life and out of people, then you're doing all the receiving and you're not giving. That's not what God has asked us to do. That's what we've got to learn to do. Now, the word society actually means interaction of people in each other's lives. What we're finding today is that there is not a lot of interaction going on. There's a lot of being in the same time and in the same space, but there's not a lot of communication or interaction going on. There's not a lot of relationships going on. There's not a lot of community happening. We might live in the same street, but are we actively interacting with anyone? We might even live in the same home, but are we actively interacting with people? Or are we just? You know what I mean. We might live in the same city, but are we interacting with anyone? Society has become pretty poor when all we're doing is crossing paths and there is something missing in our society at the minute. As Christians, the call of our life is to share life together. There is nothing in the Bible about being an individual Christian. From cover to cover or from cover to back, it's not about the person of God, but about the people of God. The Old Testament is about a group of people we call Israel. It is about the people of God, the community of God. The New Testament is all about the church. It's all about the people of God. Christ came for His people. He didn't come for Himself. He came for you and me. It's not about individuals giving their life to Jesus Christ and saying, Okay, I've got heaven sorted and that's it. That's the end of the story for me. Or I've been freely given salvation. Now I can go about my personal business and worry about myself only. Our faith is all about I've given my life to Jesus Christ and I have become part of the family of God. That's what church is. Church is an antidote to our culture. Church is an opportunity to do all those things, be all those things for each other. Since day one of Christ Point Church Melbourne, we have been saying the church is not a building but a group of people who believe in our Lord Jesus Christ, a group of people who have a true relationship with the Father in heaven and are a dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. Church is an opportunity to do all those things, be all those things for each other, to share our joys and sorrows, to encourage one another, to help one another, to love one another, to pray for one another, to forgive one another, no matter how difficult it is, to build one another up, to support one another, not the opposite. Now, these are all instructions found in the Bible. There's a whole list of one another's in scriptures, and you cannot do these one another's by yourself. I cannot do these one another's by myself. It's impossible. God's instructions to us is to be part of the family. The book of Ephesians chapter 2 verse 19 tells us this, So, then you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are God's household. 
Did you see that? But you are fellow citizens with the saints. This means that you are part of the family with every other Christian, not over every other Christian, not under every other Christian, not despite every other Christian, not inferior to any other Christian, nor superior to every other Christian. We are part of God's family with every other Christian. Church is all about others. It is never about ourselves. Church is all about others and the people who surround us, our family in Christ. And as soon as individuals, as soon as individuals start demanding my ways, my rights, this is what I want, what Samson wants, what Samson gets, this is what I think we should do, this is what I think everyone else should be doing. When we use underhandedly tactics to get our ways, lies and half-truths to get my way, emotional blackmail to get my way, when we use our titles to get our way or my way, as soon as we get to that, the church becomes wobbly. As soon as we get to that, we cease to be what God wants us to be. The people of God, the community of God, we become just a bunch of individuals meeting together like a social club or even an anti-social club because it is what's convenient for me, myself, and I. Church is much more than that. Church is about sharing our lives together in the best way that we can, and that is through the serving of our Lord Jesus Christ. To counteract our culture, the second thing is, we have to learn to give ourselves away. A self-centered attitude wants everyone to do everything for them. That's what a self-centered attitude is. When a baby is born, it is self-centered. It wants everyone around it to feed it, to hold it, to keep it warm and protect it. And that's fine, but the problem is, we never grow out of it. But we're supposed to. Let me tell you something. As soon as we learn to do things for other people, we break the grip of our culture. When we do things for other people, we introduce God culture into the lives of those you do things for. The book of Galatians chapter 5 verse 13 reminds us of the following. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but serve one another through love. Serve one another. The book of Mark chapter 10 verse 43 tells us, Whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. Now Jesus says that if you want to be great, you must be the servant of all others. God is telling us that we cannot set ourselves to be the person to be served, but must be prepared to serve others. We got to roll up our sleeves and we got to start serving other people. That brings real satisfaction to you and I. You see, the lie is that if we just serve ourselves, live for ourselves, demand everything for ourselves, then we'll be happy because we'll get all that we want. But it doesn't work. It never has worked before. But we keep telling ourselves that lie again and again. God tells us to give our life away for other people, serve other people, because that's where you find satisfaction. And when we find satisfaction, because that is what God has intended for each and every single one of us. It is better to give than to receive. And you want to know why? Because we're never satisfied. We always want more. We want to be happy all the time. The more we want, the more we get. The more we get, the more we want. But when we learn to give, there's something about doing something for somebody else that you can feel very comfortable with. You can feel satisfied and you can feel happy about what you've done. Random acts of kindness. That's what we're called to do. Now I invite you to watch the following clip with me.
random acts of kindness, giving your life away. We need to serve others, giving your life away for the benefit of others. It's almost a crazy idea today. We're in a world where it teaches us, let's get as much as we can, as big as we can, as wide as we can, as high as we can, as often as we can. John chapter 13, in the Last Supper, Jesus met with his disciples in the upper room. Now we know about the meal, you know, as the Last Supper, because we celebrated it last Sunday, as we do every first Sunday of every month. But on that night, Jesus rolled up his sleeves, and he got a basin of water and started washing the disciples' feet. In our culture, we think, what a crazy thing to do. But it wasn't. Back in those days, it was done every day. Washing people's feet, you see. It was a hot climate, and the people wore sandals. There were no concrete paths or asphalt roads. You walked in the dirt and dust. Can you imagine, as you came to somebody's house, that it would be an act of service to that person to wash their feet? Well, apart from keeping the house clean, of course. Do you know whose job it was to clean people's feet? It was the lowest servant's job. Probably the youngest, the most recently hired or slave for the household, maybe even the person that nobody else liked, and they gave him or her the rottenest job. But Jesus rolled up his sleeves. He got a basin of water and began to wash their feet. You see, Jesus modeled here what we're thinking about. Jesus deserved to be served as the guest of honor, to be seated on a big seat, on a lazy boy, on a rocking chair, on the best sofa, and have everybody else flock around him just to try and wash one of his toes. But he didn't. He lined them up and he said to them, I'm going to wash your feet. He's giving his life away for the sake of others doing something nice for the sake of doing something nice for other people. As we start to think about this, what does all this mean? What does it mean to us now? What does it mean just to try and live God culture, not Melbourne culture? What does it mean to live faith culture, not Australian culture? What does it mean to live the way God has wired us to? What does it mean to live in the way that God has intended us to live and learn to give away our lives. What does it look like for us? What does that look like for us this week? Well, it's all about self-denial, not self-centeredness. I am going to deny myself this week. I want us to do that. I want us to go out this week and deny ourselves this week. I want us all to do that, myself included, I want us to think about what is it this week that I'm going to deny myself. That's a normal part of my life. Just for the sake of trying to break the culture that I live in. How many of you that are watching right now enjoy a good cup of coffee? For those of you who know me would know that I don't function well without my hit or several hits of coffee per day. But what about this? What about in our normal routine, whenever that coffee fits in, in the morning, in the afternoon or evening, at the mall or at the particular cafe where you visit, wherever and whenever it fits in your day? What about this? Just in terms of self-denial, what about we say that this week, I'm not going to have a coffee any day of the week. There is nothing wrong with a cup of coffee. I'm not saying there is but just the self-denial stuff. Now, how much is a cup of coffee nowadays? $3.50, $4.50? How much is that a week? If you normally have one or two per day, that's a lot of money. How about every cup you don't buy? Instead, you put that money away and do something nice with it. Not for you, but for somebody else. Perhaps you can donate it to the Salvos. You can give it to charity. Perhaps the guide dogs. Perhaps you can purchase some groceries and give it to someone in need, but make sure that they are vacuum sealed due to COVID-19. Self-denial in order to benefit someone else. How many watching this this morning are chocoholics? How many here love a good old Mars bar or a Cadbury top deck? How about you deny yourself that chocolate bar this week and save that money to help somebody else? Or perhaps this, I'm going to perform a random act of kindness to someone. But not just someone, 
especially someone you don't know. Let's deny something for ourselves and do something for somebody else. What about that? Let's just say I'm not going to indulge myself in coffee or chocolate. I'm not going to think of me first. I'm going to think of someone else before me. Let's deny ourselves and contribute to somebody else's life. You may not be a coffee person or a chocolate person, but I am sure that there are some things in your life that you could possibly do without for a week. And say, I'm going to sacrifice something in my life this week for the sake of contributing to someone else's. I hope you're up for the challenge. Now, do you want to see what God is going to do in your heart as you put a very simple thing as a sacrifice into place? When you and I walk past that coffee shop and smell the coffee brewing, we can just walk past and say, Jesus, this is for you. I'm not going to have it. And you're going to walk right past. Now, I don't think it really does matter what it is that you're going to deny yourself this week. But I do think that it is a very simple exercise to simply put ourselves in a right place. Remember, we are not the center of the universe. We are part of society. We are part of a culture. We are part of God's family. We need to learn to give our lives away. We need to learn to build strong relationships. We need to learn to turn the tide from self-centeredness to others' awareness. We need to stop focusing on ourselves. We need to start learning to focus on others. We need to turn where we live into a community. We need to go from getting to giving. When we learn to do that, we become more and more like Jesus. When we learn to do that, our faith increases. When we learn to do that, we make a stand for what is good about life and we deny what is bad about it. Let's have a crack at it this week and let's see how we go. Now you can feel free to email me, text me, or use the Christ Point Church Melbourne app to send me a quick message to say how you're going and how you're enduring during the week. I'd love to hear from you. I want to hear your story. I want to hear what Jesus is doing in your life this week. If you need me to come over and pray for you because you're suffering from withdrawal symptoms or anything like that, I will. Hey, as a matter of fact, I may need you to come and pray for me because I'm already missing the coffee. I don't want to finish this morning without asking you what perhaps is or may be the most important question in your life. Have you given your life to Jesus? If you haven't, if you have not given your life to Jesus, today is the perfect day to do so. If you're struggling with pain, if you're struggling with fear, if you're struggling with uncertainty, financial issues, emotional problems, and any other burden which may be consuming you today, let me tell you that there is hope, that there is help, because to any situation, Jesus is the answer. Now, I'm not talking about religion. I'm not talking about a change of church. I'm not talking about changing your religion. I'm not talking about a plan of salvation. I am talking about the person of salvation. And that person is Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us in the book of John, chapter 1, verse 12, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. All you need to do is believe in Jesus Christ with all your heart and with all your soul. Come to Jesus today. Receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Now, if you want to receive Jesus today, there where you are, pray with me this way and repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner and need your forgiveness. I know that you died on the cross for me. I now turn away from my sin and ask you to forgive me. I now invite you into my heart and life. I now trust you as Savior, Lord and King, and I will follow you. Jesus, thank you for saving me today. In your name I pray this. Amen. If you made this prayer with me, let me welcome you into the family of God. I encourage you to contact us through our email, webpage, mobile app, and also our social media, and we would love to hear from you. If you'd like to know more about Jesus, please make contact with us and we'll help you and equip you in your new journey with Jesus Christ. I'm Carlos Corrado for Christ Point Church Melbourne. May God bless you, and we pray that you can join us next week as we continue with our November series, Confronting Our Culture, and we discuss Taming Your Netflix. Let us pray. Heavenly Father and Lord Jesus, 
the most natural thing in the world is just to live for ourselves. There's a certain feeling that nobody else is going to look after us, so we got to do it ourselves. There's a sense of wanting to always be comfortable and enjoying life, feeling good all the time. A sense of entitlement, a sense of what I want, I get. There's a sense of I am going to enjoy life as long as we're getting a whole heap of things. Lord, we know that this isn't the only thing in life. We're aware of that. We're aware that there are things we can do without and that we simply take for granted. We also are aware of the negative consequences of living for ourselves and our society is not any better for it. Our society is getting worse. We're losing the fact of what it means to be a community for the sake of living as an individual and individual gains and pursuits. Lord, we want to uphold your standards. You tell us to be involved in other people's lives. You tell us to be on the lookout for other people and share their lives, the joys and the sorrows, the good times and the bad times. Help us to be that as a church, as a spiritual family, that we will be able to share ourselves with one another, to practice those one another's sprinkled around your word. Help us to be more than that, not just to use it in a church, but in our communities, in our workplaces, in our schools and universities. Lord, help us to be salt and light in your world, to bring your values and standards into the world that we live in, the world that we work in, the gym that we exercise in, the club that we enjoy being part of. Lord, help us to be giving people, not taking people. Lord, as we think about this week, as we are trying to deny ourselves something, just to try and put into practice what you call us to be, Lord, I pray that you help us all as individuals as we grapple with that to think about our own lives and to think about what we can deny ourselves that we take for granted for the sake of someone else lord help us with that help us to think about it lord i pray for your blessing as we do that as we wrestle with being a christian in a non-christian culture we pray that your holy spirit enables us to take the stands that we need to make that we're able to make choices that honor you and not ourselves Lord, we pray that we might be people who radiate your goodness, your mercy, and that the world around us may see your reality and your truth and be impacted by it. May the Father's hand keep you from stumbling. The footprints of Jesus give you the strength and confidence to follow. And the fire of the Holy Spirit keep you warm and safe in your walk with God today, tomorrow, and always. I pray this and a whole lot more in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.